Hi everybody, this is Dave Staus, Practice Group Leader of Hush Blackwell's National Prophecy and Cybersecurity Practice. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, our Privacy Law Update. We've got a lot to cover during today's program, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. For those of you who have attended one of our prior webinars, you know that we like to start the webinars with a roadmap. And so these are the topics that we intend to cover today. We're going to start by giving you an update on the uh, CCPA. Um, obviously, there's a lot to talk about with the CCPA these days, including the final regulations. And then we'll pivot and talk a little bit about CCPA 2.0. We're calling that the uh, CPRA, the California Privacy Rights Act. Um, and so we'll talk about that, give a status update of where those things stand as well. And then we'll get, uh, briefly touch upon the state breach notification statute amendments. There's not a ton to talk about there, but we'll hit on that. And then we'll pivot on topic number four. We'll talk about U.S. privacy law updates. That's kind of a grab bag of all different things that we've seen over the last few months. And then finally, we'll give the GDPR update. And while that's uh, only one of five categories, uh, I think that that's going to end up uh, being the majority of our presentation today. So we'll start where uh, I said we would with the CCPA update. And the question that we've gotten from all of our clients so far has been on what the status of the final regulations is. And so, I mean, the, the status right now of the final regulations is, well, sometime between now and January 1st, to be frank. Um, I think if you've tracked our prior webinars, you know that this has been a moving target, that the Attorney General's office missed its deadline uh, for um, submitting the final regulations so that they would go into effect on July 1st. And uh, so where we stand right now is that the final regulation package has, in fact, been submitted uh, to the Office of Administrative Law. Uh, but the Office of Administrative Law has until November 13th to review those final regulations. Uh, we previously talked about the final regulations. We thought our best guess was that they would go into effect October 1st. But there's been a change since our last webinar, and that is primarily around the fact that the, um, the Governor Newsom has entered a second executive order, which gives another 60 days to review these. So we knew about the previous executive order extending the deadline to review the regulations by uh, 60 days initially in light of COVID, and now we know that there is a second executive order. So that's the total of 120 days um, that the OAL has to review these regulations. Um, and so if you know, if you've tracked this in the past, you know that the way that this typically happens is the regulations go into effect on quarterly effective dates. So OAL will perform its review, and if it blesses it, it'll submit the regulations to the Secretary of State and then the, uh, the regulations become effective on one of these quarterly effective dates, the next one being October 1st. Uh, what is unclear right now is whether the OAL will review and submit the regulations before that October 1st uh, effective date. Again, it has the 120 days, so it has uh, beyond that time frame. And in fact, if it takes all that time, then it looks like we're looking at July 1st as the effective date. That said, and it seems like there's always a caveat with the CCPA these days, um, the Office of Administrative Law, they ha did receive from the Attorney General's Office a request for expedited review. Um, the, uh, that request has been so far ignored. Uh, but one aspect of that request was that the AG's office asked that the regulations become effective upon filing with the Secretary of State not at one of the quarterly effective dates. So point being, at the end of the day, uh, I mean, it's moving target, right? And so we're saying sometime between now and January 1st, as we know more, you will know more. We'll keep you updated on this topic, obviously. Um, I think the question we get, though, from clients these days is what, what should I do uh, in light of this moving target? Um, you know, it basically fits into two camps, right? The first camp is if you don't have any CCPA disclosures up, if you're not doing anything around the CCPA, you, you got to get done. And you'll see that in a second, that enforcement has begun. The second caveat is if you drove compliance with the original regulations um, or the draft regulations, I should say, you know, to meet that January 1st deadline, you know, our advice to clients has been, and we've been working with clients, on updating their privacy policies, updating their practices, updating their responses to reflect the final regulations. I think it's one of those things that, you know, if you take a, an orderly approach to these things, you, you place yourself in a much better position than just waiting uh, for what could be sort of a hair on fire type of situation. 
Okay, I mentioned it before uh, about enforcement, and you know, enforcement has in fact begun. Uh, as of July 1st, the Attorney General's Office, in fact, does have the ability to enforce. And I think it's important to note that they have the ability to enforce the statute, not the regulations, because again, the regulations are not finalized. Um, and so, uh, if you've tracked this, you know that a representative from the Attorney General's Office uh, gave a webinar. Uh, with the IEPP and confirm that they had sent out, the office had sent out notices of violation um, after the enforcement uh, time frame began. Um, the contours of this is not abundantly clear right now. There's not a lot of information that was disclosed. Uh, but what was talked about is, again, they're enforced in the statute, not the regulations. There's not a particular focus on any industry other than being online. Uh, they are monitoring things like consumer complaints and litigation to see what the hot button issues are and the hot button companies are. Um, and you know, I, I think at the end of the day, what this comes down to is, you know, this statute is being enforced, right? Uh, that is the large takeaway here, and we'll kind of see how this plays out. There's a 30-day cure period, and so. Um, you know, maybe within uh, the month of August or soon thereafter, we might get some more information about these enforcement actions. One other thing to flag as well is we are seeing more and more cases get filed around the CCPA. This is a page from the IEPP's website where they are tracking uh, the litigation. Uh, they've tracked 13 cases. Uh, other sources that we've looked at have had more cases. You know, some have said a few dozen cases. Um, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say, right, without looking at every single complaint. But I think the fact of the matter is, uh, and the takeaway is, is that you know we're seeing litigation around the CCPA. Now, the big caveat to this is, uh, for those of you who have tracked the CCPA, you know that the private right of action only extends to data breaches. And the class action damages around those that you know between $100 and $750 per consumer per incident, right? Uh, and you know I think what we're seeing in this litigation and what this IEPP summary really does a good job of is identifying that plaintiffs' lawyers are going beyond the four corners of what they can do, and they are in fact making allegations uh, relating to the notice of collection and the, the right to opt out of sale. Uh, and so we're seeing this in different contexts, right? And ultimately, I think what this, this sort of reinforces, and we'll talk about this with Shrems too as well, is that at the end of the day, right, the courts are going to look at this, and the courts are going to be the final arbiters of what this statute means. And artful pleading is sort of the hope of the plaintiff's bar right now that they can maybe get some of these concepts through, and not in the sense of, hey, you violated this section of the CCPA, but the potential of saying things like, hey, it's negligence or it's consumer fraud um, by not doing certain things, and it's just that those things match up to the CCPA, right? And that's sort of the artful pleading that we're seeing, and I know people who have tracked this will say, well, that's just not, you know, that's not possible with the way the statute is, and it's, you know, don't shoot the messenger, right? I mean, we always, I think, assumed that this was going to happen, that these allegations are going to be made in litigation, and we're just going to have to see how this plays out. And the reality is this could play out for years in the court system. As, um, and I think that's really going to be the next big thing, right, that we look at. Uh, the CPRA, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, and then we're going to talk, you know, we're talk about the litigation that comes out of this and the court rulings and motions to dismiss and those types of things. One other thing to flag, which I think is notable, right, is there's this cure period in the data breach class action section, which essentially says before you can be sued, somebody needs to provide you with notice and the, the ability to cure the violations, right? Uh, the way they're trying to get around that now is by filing lawsuits for injunctive relief only and then saying that they will amend after you respond to the cure, the notice of violation. Um, I don't know that that dog will hunt at the end of the day. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that's an effective way of getting around that cure period. Uh, but again, that's what we're seeing in the case law right now and the complaints that is. Okay, um, you know, something that we talked a ton about last year, right, was amendments around the CCPA. Uh, last year, it seemed like we were tracking 20 to 25 bills on a regular basis, uh, looking at committee hearings, 
uh, looking at transcripts, the whole bit, right, and tracking the amendments to the CCPA ad nauseum. In fact, you know, I can recall uh, waiting on the night of, of September 13th to um, see what bills actually passed, and we did a webinar the following Monday, and we spent the whole weekend journeying through these things and trying to understand what had happened. Uh, I don't expect that to be the case this year. Uh, this year, based on our research, it looks like there are only two cases that are in play right now. I'm sorry, cases. Two amendments that are in play right now. One would be around the HIPAA exemption, and the second one would be to extend the business and business and employee exemptions until uh, next year. So it looks like those two are still live, and we will wait and see what happens with them. Uh, August 31st is the last date for each of the houses to pass bills. Um, and so, you know, we'll see, and we'll see, and wait, what, wait, what, see what happens. I think on the, the business to business and employee exemptions, we'll talk about it in a second, though. Uh, but in the context of the California Privacy Rights Act, the CPRA, if that passes in November, there will be an automatic two year extension there for the business to business and the employee exemptions. So it looks, you know, if that's relevant to your uh, business and to your compliance structure, it looks like you've got multiple avenues for that to get across the finish line and get some relief there. Okay, so let's change gears just a touch and talk about the California Privacy Rights Act. What I will say is, is that I'm going to briefly talk about a few things that I think are the most important aspects of the CPRA, talk about where we stand with it, and uh, you know, some of the context around the, the politics right now. Uh, if you are looking for a deeper dive into the CPRA, my suggestion would be to take a look at YouTube and Google Hush Blackwell, Malia Rogers and I did a 25-minute uh, on on-demand webinar uh, a month or so ago on the CPRA and reviewed it in more depth. So I really encourage you, if you want a little more context, to take a look at that. So I start off um, every discussion of the CPRA with this. And, you know, people can disagree, but to me, um, this is really, you know, what I think the biggest deal of, of the, C the CPRA is. I think we'll look back and people will talk about the new rights they get created, they'll talk about the regulations and all those types of things. I feel like this is the biggest thing, and others will disagree with me um, and are entitled to their opinions, but for me, this is it, right? Uh, the creation of an administrative agency whose job it is to enforce the privacy laws, right? Uh, to me, this is a game changer because, one, this agency is going to be funded in part by um, it defines that it levies, right? So a self-funding mechanism is uh, a really interesting mechanism to do this, right? I mean, you are, you are going to be incentivized to get out there and enforce these laws because there's a direct correlation between that and uh, the operating budget of the entity, right? But I think also what's in play, though, right, is that this would be a sophisticated entity with resources in place not only to enforce but to also provide guidance, right? And so this, to me, feels a lot like the European model of having supervisory authorities, right, that can publish guidance on the law, that can publish FAQs and all those things. And, you know, when you think about this, if you, if you were like me and you sat down with the 500 pages of comments to the CCPA regulations and you comb through them, you were left with, you know, going through there and consistently it was, here's the comment, what is the answer? And the answer was, uh, go talk to a lawyer maybe in a lot of times, right? I feel like that was like a third of the answers was go talk to a lawyer. Or, you know, the answer was in sometimes, you know, basically saying we didn't have time to look at that. It might be something for future rulemaking, all those types of things, right? And the reality is, it's not a knock on the AG's office. The reality is that the AG's office has limited resources, and it's doing the best job it can with those limited resources. But if you create an agency who has, un not unlimited, but, but more resources in place and more sophistication and focus on these things, the expectation in my mind really would be that we would get a lot more answers to these questions, a lot more guidance, a lot more FAQs, those types of things. But again, as well, really focusing on the fact that, you know, enforcement, I think, would be the risk factor enforcement would go up substantially. So just briefly, then, talking about the rights associated with 
um, the new rights that would be created by the by the CPRMA. Here, here they are. Um, a lot of these will be familiar to people in the GDPR construct, right? Who are familiar with that. Um, for me, I think the one that's really kind of uh, interesting is the right uh, the restricted use of, of sensitive information. There's going to be this subset of sensitive information that would be created, and that's got you know those familiar with GDPR will will recognize that concept there, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, you will see new rights that are created under the CPRA uh, if it in fact passes. Okay, and the question that we get asked the most, right, is, uh, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, voters are going to vote on this in November. I think it's November 3rd, if memory serves. Uh, so, Dave, what does that look like? Does the world change on November 4th? The answer is no. Um, most of the provisions will not become operative until uh, two years uh, from that time, approximately two years, right, January 1st, 2023. And, um, you know, those again familiar with GDPR will recognize this sort of two-year time frame, right? And it's a ramp-up period. Now, having said that, I've got the exceptions there. I mentioned it before. The business to business and the employee exemptions, they would be extended until that uh, January 1st, 2023, but only until that January 1st. 2023, right? Um, at that point in time, they will become inoperative, and the thought process there has been that that would allow the legislature time to um, work on those exemptions. Um, you know, they are not considered to be finalized products. There were still negotiations going around there, so this would give time for that to happen. The second thing would be, you know, this agency I was just talking about in the previous slide. That would be, uh, you know, created, and as you might imagine, it takes time to create an agency and get people hired and all those things. Uh, so that would that would start immediately as well. So with with respect to the implementation timeline, there you see the November third election date, right, and then you see, you know, moving left to right, this sort of orderly process of how the CPRA would come about. Um, I think some dates to sort of uh, take away from this one, the July 1st, 2021 is the approximate start date for the agency rulemaking process. There's some um, squishiness there in, um, uh, in, in the CPRA, I think just primarily based around the fact that it's going to take time to, to step up uh, this agency, and that could happen sooner rather than later. Um, but when it's ready to go, and I think that's the outward date, the July 1st one, if memory serves, of when it would be stood up. Um, and then it will go about doing the rulemaking process, right? And I think something, and it was on a prior slide, I didn't mention it, but something to really kind of talk about here is the topics upon which the CPRA, I'm sorry, the, the agency enforcing the statute would uh, have regulate, regulatory authority over would be greatly expanded. A number of new regulatory topics would be added to the list that the uh, new agency would be issuing regulations on, right? So you're not going to have less regulations, you're going to have more regulations. The good news, I think, is that uh, this process will be played out in an orderly fashion, much different than what we kind of saw with the CCPA. Uh, July 1st, 2022 would be the date for the agency to adopt regulations. Uh, six months later, um, you know, the CPRA becomes fully operative, and then six months later, uh, you see the enforcement date, right? So sort of a more orderly process here would be the hope. Okay, so the next question that we get asked a ton, right, is will it pass? Uh, and so this got released on Monday. The um, Californians for Consumer Privacy, um, they uh, commissioned um, polling on this, and you may recall that when the CPRA originally dropped, when Alice McTaggart originally dropped it, that uh, he issued polling at the same time, and the support for that polling was in like the high 80s, right? I think about 88% were in favor. They updated that polling, and this was released um, just a few days ago, like I said, on Monday, August 3rd, and this shows 81% uh, in favor, so a slight drop, you know, 7% drop of people who are in favor of it. Um, and what they also said is that when they present the, the opposition arguments to the bill, or the ballot measure, I should say, uh, that that support went down to 72%. So it's gotten lighter. The support has gotten a touch lighter. Uh, I don't know that it matters when you're talking about 70 and 80%. This is a simple majority for this thing to pass. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to be predicting, but it, it looks good for it to pass, right? 
That said, uh, an interesting uh, thing that's come about in the last week or so is that a number of privacy organizations have actually come out either neutral or against the CPRA. Uh, the ACLU of Northern California has taken the position that this is a fake privacy law. Uh, you see that in the tweet there. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, position, I think, for the ACLU to take. I think you can say many things about the CCPA. You can say many things about the CPRA. Uh, calling it a fake privacy law, I think, is a unique thing to say. Uh, the EFF has also taken a, uh, they've taken a no uh, position, uh, do not favor, do not oppose uh, this ballot measure. Um, the issues, I mean, you know, the question you'd be thinking about is, you know, well, I thought this was pushed by privacy advocates, why aren't the privacy entities here supporting it? I, I think there's a few factors right in play. One, one is, um, you know, they do have concerns they, they, about the prior right of action. That's always sort of been the thing that, that most people have seized upon in the privacy field. They, they want a private right of action, right, to enforce this. And that's been the reason why the Washington Privacy Act could not get across the finish line, right? And that's been the fight in a federal uh, privacy bill as well. Um, and so this, the CPRA does not have that, and so that's a reason to oppose it. I think as well, I mean, there's talk, um, you know, just from a high level about the, 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 the mode being wrong, right? I mean, if you look at GDPR, GDPR is an upfront consent privacy statute. You need notice and consent for the collection of information. And here, uh, it's an opt-out strat uh, uh, structure, right? I mean, you provide notice, but then people um, can ask for their information. They can opt out of sales. Um, and ask that their information be deleted, but there's a lot of exceptions and the right to be forgotten, and there's some talk that, you know, in fact, the CPRA would extend those exceptions. So in any event, there are criticisms here uh, from privacy advocates, I should say. I, I think, though, you know, the cynic in me thinks, um, you know, if this polling was at 50%, instead of 80%, would, would these same organizations be opposed to it, uh, recognizing that this is going to raise the stakes in privacy law in this country? I don't, I don't know, right? I think it would be a different story if they felt like it was um, not a sure thing to pass. And, and you know, something else to keep in mind as well, I think what these organizations recognize is, and this is what McTaggart recognized when he, when he pushed his ballot measure, is that other states will be looking to California for purposes of modeling what California is doing. And the federal government may look as well at what California is doing and use that as a model, right? And so privacy advocates are essentially, I think, staking out their territory of saying, you know, we want more, notwithstanding what's going on here. Okay, so just briefly, I will touch on state breach notification statute amendments. So there's not a ton to talk about in this regard. I think um, you know one of the things is the uh, COVID uh, shut down a lot of state legislatures. We saw that. You know, in the next slide, I'll talk about no one else passing CCPA copycat bills, but I think it also sort of impacted all sort of state privacy law uh, legislation to some degree. Uh, and so we, you know, only three states really to talk about: uh, Vermont, Washington, and, and the District of Columbia. District of Columbia not being a state, but you get the point. Um, the takeaway on these, I think, is you know we, we're just seeing this continual amendment process now. That's where we're at with these breach notification statutes. What we talk about now is expanding the, uh, the, the definition of personal information to include things like biometrics and health information, login credentials, those types of things, right? And there are people are also tinkering with the notice requirements, you know, 30 days, 45 days, those types of things, and also uh, the notice contents, right, uh, what you must say in a notification letter. These are the things that we see state legislatures going back and, and tinkering with, and we've seen that for a few years now, right. Uh, none of these states here have, um, at least in, um, I should say, uh, well, let me backtrack a little bit. So one, one thing that we've seen over the past few years is um, states also add things like credit monitoring, right, requirement that if like social security numbers are breached, that, that credit monitoring would, would be required to be added. Okay. So I think, you know, point being is I think we'll continue to see this over the next few years as states just, you know, every year we'll see a group of states take a look at their statutes and amend them and uh, just keep adding more PI, tinkering with the notice requirements, maybe adding credit monitoring, things like that. 
Okay, so uh, just want to sort of give you a grab bag of a couple more slides of other U.S. privacy law updates, and then we will cross the Atlantic and talk about uh, what's going over and going on over in Europe. So the first thing I kind of wanted to flag is uh, federal contact tracing privacy legislation. So the story here is obviously COVID happened, and then you had uh, you know a number of tech organizations. Um, uh, publicly stating that they were creating contact tracing apps, right? And, you know, this could be based on Bluetooth or this could be based on uh, geolocation. We even had one client who was using Wi-Fi as a basis for doing contact tracing. Uh, and I think people know this already, so I won't, I won't really get into the details of it. Um, but there is no, really no legal structure around here, absent maybe like California and the employee notice provisions there or just the consumer notice provisions there, depending on how you're going to use these things. Um, so, you know, we saw some federal bills get proposed. First, it was the Republican bill, and then it was the Democrat bill, and then it was a bipartisan bill. And, uh, you know, when the bipartisan bill got proposed, I, to be blunt, I was optimistic we might actually see something on a federal law uh, level around privacy legislation. Uh, that has not come to pass, at least so far. Not saying that something can't happen, but there hasn't been big momentum in that regard to get this across the finish line. Uh, and so we wait. We wait to see if anything happens here. There was talk about a group of senators who were asking in this second stimulus bill that's being negotiated about asking for that to be added, um, their version, the Democratic version, to be added to that. Um, but that's obviously all up in the air right now. Uh, so we just sort of continue to, to look to the federal government. Well, what I think we see is I think we see a constant, you know, people are proposing bills in the privacy space on a fairly regular basis, right? And to be honest, I rarely talk about them on our blog. I rarely talk about them in webinars. And it's just, um, it, it's, it's just, you know, maybe if, if the election happens and we get an all democratic government, well, it'll be a different paradigm for getting uh, privacy legislation passed, but but right now, you know, we, we, it's just hard to envision it, right? It's hard to envision the federal government doing something. Maybe they will. I, this is a discrete issue here, contact tracing ads. I would think there's a lot of commonality, but again, where people, you know, really come down to disagreement is the enforcement mechanism. What is interesting is that bipartisan bill there in fact, has a blended enforcement mechanism that could be used as a model for wider spread privacy legislation. But anyway, we'll continue to track it. We'll see what happens. Okay, uh, last slide then before I talk about uh, Europe. Uh, and this is sort of just a grab bag of other stuff that we're saying and just want to make sure you guys are aware of it. First, I mean, you know, we gave a, a webinar back in, I think maybe it was February, and we were talking about all the different privacy bills that were proposed on the state level and, you know, who's going to pass what this year. And, um, you know, I, I think I'd be embarrassed to go back and, and listen to my predictions about what would happen. <laughs> right? I think, I think all of us in the privacy space were thinking that uh, one or two states would, would pass something this year, and it just never happened. Um, Washington, again, got right up into the finish line, and they just could not reach agreement on the enforcement mechanism there, the prior right of action versus attorney general enforcement. Uh, maybe they'll try again next year. You know, I think we had maybe 16 states where legislation was proposed, maybe more, um, and nothing's happened. Um, we'll wait and see. Uh, I mean, obviously, COVID got in the way a lot of this. And wait and see. I don't. I don't think anybody thinks this is going away. Um, in some respects, I think it's good for privacy law to have the CCPA roll out and to have you know other state legislatures look at this and take a longer look at what's going on and trying to figure out whether that's a model that actually works or whether a different model is something that would work better in this country. Uh, New York, sort of a pivot to New York. A couple of things going on there. We're flagging the uh, New York Division of Financial Services. Um, filed its first enforcement action. If you are subject to the NYDFS's cybersecurity regulations, um, you're probably aware of this, but if not, you know, worth, um, worth taking a look at. And then, you know, in March of this past year, uh, you would be excused if you missed it, <laughs> given we were all uh, shutting down at that point in time. 
uh, that the New York Shield Act status security provisions that were passed last year, they went into effect. We haven't seen any enforcement actions around that right now, but you know, stay tuned. Uh, we expect to see them. Last thing to flag before pivoting to Europe is um, the FTC. They, they updated their Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, FAQs, uh, just on July 22nd, so very, very recently. Um, if this is relevant to you, I do think it's worth taking a look. In particular, there's a section now on, um, you know, a beefed up discussion, I should say, on uh, when schools can essentially provide parental consent and when they can fill that gap. And I think this really, in my mind, is relevant to all of the online um, schooling that this country is going through. I know my kids are doing online schooling and using a lot more um, online platforms than obviously you would if you were going in for in-person um, schooling. So anyway, something to take a look at that's relevant to you. It is kind of an interesting read. OK, so let's pivot enough about the United States. Let's talk about Europe and go over a GDPR update. So two topics I want to kind of talk about here. Uh, first one being you know, consent issues, in particular around cookies. And the second one is the uh, Schrems 2 decision, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So we'll talk about cookies first. Um, I think this is my, my favorite slide. I think this is, uh, Malia told me this was her favorite slide as well. We didn't come up with this one, uh, but it is, uh, I just think it's a great slide, right? It introduces our next topic, which is in fact cookies. Okay, so uh, we'll start here, and you may have missed it. On May 4th, 2020, the European Data Protection Board issued its guidelines on consent. And it's about a 30-page document. I won't drill down into everything here. Obviously, it would take a long time to do so. I think the bigger issue is just to make sure that you're, you're aware of this. Um, there is a lot of examples provided in this document uh, about consent, in particular around marketing and in particular around, around cookies, frankly. Um, and you'll see that you know, European data protection uh, super, or European uh, uh, supervisory authorities uh, have been issuing updated guidance, and it sort of reflects this EDPB guidance that came out as well. So on that issue, we have seen uh, recently guidance from the Irish, Spanish, and French data protection authorities on um, these issues. Uh, and you know, we saw the Irish guidance came out in April, Spanish guidance came out um, in July, just a couple weeks ago, and obviously the French data protection authority has been working on this for a little while. Um, and where we see commonality, right, is everyone is saying um, session cookies obviously require, uh, are, are, are exempt, you know, I say session cookies, strictly necessary cookies are uh, exempt from the consent requirements, everything else requires consent for usage. Um, so. Um, you know, sort of extrapolating from that, right, uh, one of the other uh, things we see that, that comes out of this guidance is there's differences in approaches about how particular uh, these agencies want your cookie notices to be. Um, the French Data Protection Authority, I think, is fairly detailed in what it would like to see. The Irish and um, even like the ICO over in the UK, I think, are just more principle-based here. But obviously, something worth digging into. If you haven't looked at your cookie um, disclosure recently, or your cookie consent um, settings and disclosures there recently, it's something worth digging into. Uh, on the French um, guidance, uh, those who follow this will know that in June of 2020, so just a couple of months ago, France's highest administrative court issued a decision that partially annulled uh, the guidelines that were uh, put out by the French Data Protection Authority. Um, those guidelines have been published in July 2019, and then uh, draft recommendations are published January 14, 2020. You can see that there. Um, uh, you know, that's the screenshot I have to the right there. In the decision, they, um, you know, the court, it, it didn't take a position on whether cookie walls were lawful, but instead rested its uh, decision on whether the French DPA could uh, uh, set out an absolute ban on cookie walls in a soft law instrument like the guidelines. Um, all their arguments with respect to cookies were rejected, and the French DPA subsequently announced that it will publish revised guidelines in September, which is just next month. Uh, 
So I think, again, I think the takeaway from all this is really that you know, there's been some movement. And if you haven't looked at these things, your cookie notice or your consent banner and all those types of things recently, I think it's something to, to take a look at. OK, uh, so the last topic we'll talk about, but it's obviously a very big topic in light of what's happened recently, is the Schrems II court decision. So I know uh, some of you will be very familiar with the European um, uh, legal system. And uh, for others, this will be very um, uh, new to you. Uh, so I thought it might be useful at the beginning of this is just to take a couple of minutes and just you know lay some foundation here. And I, for those who are sophisticated on this issue, I beg your, uh, your pardon here. But I'll, I'll make it short and sweet. But just want to sort of set the table just a little bit here. So on this slide, this comes from the EU's um, Website. This is the legal structure, and the two agencies we're going to be talking about, or two entities, I should say, we'll be talking about here are the European Commission at the top right of this chart, and the Court of Justice. And the European Commission, for lack of a short, better shorthand, is essentially the executive arm of the EU, and um, the Court of Justice is what you would think, right? It's a the High Court. So, at the risk of being incredibly uh, uh, lack of nuance on this issue. Uh, what is Schrems II about? It is about cross-border data transfers from Europe uh, to the United States. And so the, 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 the background here is Europe has taken the position that it is uh, the model uh, for privacy law in this world, and that if you are going to collect personal data of uh, individuals, data subjects, and it's going to be subject to GDPR, uh, that those laws need to be respected. And you cannot have an organization that will transfer data to a third country where it's going to be exposed to laws that are not providing the same amount of safeguards as are provided under GDPR, right? Okay. And so when we pivot this, then um, we see uh, this reflected in, in Article 44 of GDPR. And so this is Article 44 here. And obviously, I'm not going to read all this. I think the takeaway here is, again, it's this concept that uh, if, you're gonna, if you are going to transfer data uh, across borders to a third country, you need to ensure that the safeguards are in place. So then the question is, what are the safeguards? Uh, there's three buckets. And again, at the risk of being way too general about this, uh, but for purposes of streamlining the discussion, you know, three buckets, uh, adequacy decisions, and that's essentially the European Commission looks at the laws of the third country and makes a determination that those laws are adequate and they ensure an adequate level of protection, right? So that's the European Commission. We'll talk about uh, that in a second. Uh, and then there's Article 46, and that's the appropriate safeguards article. That's things like binding corporate rules and standard contractual clauses. And that becomes really relevant in the construct, uh, construct of Schrems II, and I'll talk about that a touch more in a second. And then there's derogations, Article 49, uh, things like consent necessary for performance of contract, those types of things. OK, so adequacy decisions, then that was the first bucket there. Uh, this, again, is where the European Commission makes a decision that um, the laws of the third country are adequate. Uh, this is the list of the adequacy decisions that are in place, 13, but really 12 now, and let us run two. Uh, and then we've mapped it out here. And I, I think what the takeaway is, there's not a lot of places in the world where you can transfer data, uh, and the EU considers it to be adequate. Uh, Canada is acceptable, Japan, New Zealand, uh, obviously Switzerland. And then um, you know uh, some all smaller places and some of these islands that are off of European coastlines. So in the United States, and just sort of give you the background on this one as quickly as possible. In the United States, the uh, Department of Commerce, the European Commission, they negotiated the Privacy Shield framework, right? And so here, what the concept is is uh, US laws are inadequate. However, if an organization agrees to this framework and self-certifies that uh, with the FTC that it is subject to this framework and it's abiding by this framework, then that will be adequate, right? And the European Commission looked at the framework and obviously it was heavily negotiated and said, this is adequate. If these organizations do these things, 
this will be adequate. And as of the STREMS 2 decision, there was about 5,400 organizations who, in fact, had self-certified and were active participants in Privacy Shield framework. And so this allowed this, you know, this first bucket of adequacy, um, adequate safeguards, allowed some U.S. companies who would self-certify to be able to transfer information across borders. And then the second one that's relevant to the SREMS 2 decision is the standard contractual clauses, right? So this would be, instead of um, the Privacy Shield framework, parties to a contract would say, we agree to the standard contractual clauses published by the European Commission here, available on its website, right? It's been around for many years. And this is essentially, you know, this transfer is data exporter and data importer. By agreeing to these provisions, it provides adequacy. Okay, um, and these are model clauses. Um, they are not to be you know, messed with a lot, um, and they essentially provide, again, they provide this legal structure for transferring data to other countries. So what happened in SHREMS 2? Then we finally got there. Uh, the easiest thing to talk about is Privacy Shield was invalidated. Uh, this was, I think, uh, not the prevailing wisdom of what was going to happen. Uh, with this uh, ruling, but in fact it did happen. Um, it's not the first time that uh, a similar framework has been struck down. Safe Harbor was struck down in SHREMS 1, and now Privacy Shield is struck down and validated in SHREMS 2. So why was it uh, invalidated? Well, essentially, you know, there was this clause in the Privacy Shield framework that said, and it's here in the bullet point, that adherence to these principles may be limited to the extent necessary to meet national security uh, public interest or law enforcement requirements. So what are national security requirements? Well, those are things like national surveillance laws. And um, that includes Section 702 of FISA and EO 12333. And those are specifically called out by the Court of Justice in its opinions. And basically what it comes down to is it says, yes, you know, this framework doesn't work because it still allows the U.S. government to snoop on the data of, of, that's transferred to the United States, and that's just insufficient. The second piece of the puzzle is the court looked at the standard contractual clauses, and it upheld the standard contractual clauses, uh, but it really reinforced, right, that these documents that were sort of form documents and people would just attach to the uh, end of data pr uh, processing agreements uh, needed to actually be vetted. Um, and uh, in fact, the, the court emphasized that there's an obligation to ensure that the, the laws in the recipient country are sufficient, right? And you know, this essentially means if you're transferring data over there, yes, you have a contract, but is the legal environment to which you are transferring it um, is that, is that um, uh, going to interfere with your standard contractual clauses? And if it is, then you should not be doing the data transfers unless you can take supplementary measures and put those in place to ensure that those laws will not impede on the rights of the individuals whose information is being transferred. So as you might imagine, um, you know, the striking down a privacy shield uh, caused a lot of angst, and it, as it should. Uh, but also with the, the court's comments on the standard contractual clauses, um, raised a lot of issues as well, right? And here you see the European Data Protection Board issuing uh, part of its FAQs on the SREMS decision. And what it reinforces is that if you are going to make data transfers based on the SECs, that you need to uh, do an assessment, and you need to take into account uh, the circumstances of the transfer, and you need to put in place supplementary measures to address anything that you identify as being problematic, right? So again, the process needs to be respected here, right? It's not enough just to attach an SEC to a document. This has to be a case-by-case -case analysis in which you're looking at the laws of that state, you're looking at the nature of the transfers, and you're putting supplementary measures in place. So I've mentioned supplementary measures a few times now. The question then is, well, what are supplementary measures? And that's a good question. <laughs> we do not, in fact, have a good answer on this right now. There's been discussion, and you know, the commentators have, have had discussions about what supplementary measures would look like. Um, but as far as you know, authoritative interpretations, we don't have it. And in fact, here, the EDPB has said, uh, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll get, a, we'll, we're working on it, right? 
Uh, some of the things that people have suggested have been things like encryption at rest, encryption at transit, keeping the data in a country in which there is an adequacy decision, or keeping it in Europe, making it accessible on a read-only basis, making it um, you know, deletion of the information as quickly as possible after there's no use in it anymore. So, you know, one or two day lifespan, right, on the information, those types of things. Um, and listen, these are all smart people looking at this and coming up with uh, potential solutions here. We just don't know right now is the reality. Um, and, but I, but the, you know, the fact of the matter is that, that you have to be looking at this and you have to be trying to solve the unsolvable right now. And then, you know, once we do get guidance, be looking at what that guidance says and pivoting from there. And so I'm going to, uh, we'll go through about four or five um, of these slides quickly. This is, you know, these, these uh, member state data protection authorities um, came out with their own statements on this as well about you know, what the SECs and what cross-border transfers look like in the wake of SHREMS too. This is the Irish DPA, and those familiar with SHREMS will know that the Irish DPA was, was you know, uh, part of the SHREMS case, in fact, uh, as a party in that case. Um, and, and here it says, you know, it says that the, the, the transfer of personal data to the United States is now questionable. So, um, you know, a lot to be decided here. And in fact, you know, part of the SHREMS decision was to punt it to um, supervisory authorities and to say that they needed to ensure that these uh, measures were, were in place and if not to shut down transfers to, um, to those third countries. Now, on the most aggressive side of this is Germany, Berlin, and uh, essentially taking the position this is two days after um, Schrems was issued, taking the position that you just can't transfer data to the United States. Um, this has not been the prevailing approach at the DPAs, uh, but this has been at least Germany, Berlin's approach, and obviously very aggressive. In comparison, uh, the Conference of Independent Data Protection Authorities uh, in Germany uh, issued this guidance, February or July 28th, right? So sometime after the previous guidance, more permissive, right? Um, again, emphasizing here that there needs to be an assessment and supplementary measures, those types of things. The French Data Protection Authority has taken the position that they are looking at it and will be working with the EDPB. And this again, July 17th, so just really shortly after Schrems was issued. And then finally, and I say finally, I mean there's there's other, obviously there's other data protection authorities out there who have issued, I think everyone has issued guidance on Schrems too, but just wanted to kind of give you a flavor of some of the ones um, that are out there. Uh, you know, the ICO, not, not a member state anymore, right, in light of, of Brexit, uh, but the ICO has taken a measured approach here, um, you know, there in the, in the highlighted text. We are therefore taking time to consider carefully what this means in practice. We will continue to apply a risk-based and proportionate approach in accordance with our regulatory action policy. Now, I think one of the reasons why I pulled out the ICO is in light of Brexit, right, uh, very soon, um, the UK is going to have to go through this process as well. And what I mean by that is, you know, the UK is going to be outside GDPR, and there needs to be an adequacy decision in place if transfers to the UK are going to be able to survive there, or whether there needs to be standard contractual clauses in place for those transfers, right? So one day in GDPR, transfers are fine. The next day, even though the you know, the idea is to, to, to replicate GDPR in UK law, uh, you're in the inadequacy decision. And so they'll be looking at things like national surveillance laws like they did in Schrems uh, when making these decisions. So I think, you know, it's interesting uh, to see how this will play out in the next year or so. So then, you know, path forward, right, uh, just have a couple slides on this one sort of talking about what you should do from here. Uh, the simple one is Privacy Shield is dead. Uh, so if you've been relying upon Privacy Shield, um, you have to find an alternative. There was really no mystery there. The EDPB and its FAQs that came out said there was no grace period uh, for these transfers. It's, it's invalidated Privacy Shield, um, and, and that's the end of it. Uh, and your, uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce has um, come out and said, reminded organizations that 
um, that still belong to the Privacy Shield, they have obligations under that framework, right? It's contractual nature of that. So just because Privacy Shield has been invalidated does not mean that those obligations have gone away. With respect to the standard contractual clauses, um, again, so this is sort of the process we're thinking about here, and I think this is reflected in the commentary to date. It's a case-by-case -case analysis. You've got to be focusing on this on a case-by-case on -case basis. Uh, and I think it starts with, and this isn't as, as prevalent, I think, in the commentary, but I, I like to think of this as a starting point, is a look at the data analysis, what the what data is actually involved, right? And in that regard, I mean, this is part of the SEC process as well, but I think it's just sort of, you know, again, it's front and center, right? I mean, it's it's one of the first principles of privacy law is that you have to look at the nature of what, what data is at issue. Uh, and I think it's kind of a much different situation if you're talking about names, uh, and addresses versus talking about highly sensitive medical information, right? Or email communications or those types of things, right? I just think it's different. And so I think, you know, that needs to be recognized. Now, legal analysis is the sort of the next step. Uh, that's really a look at, you know, laws in the country here being the United States, obviously, uh, and the impact of these national surveillance laws. And so I think where people are getting at here, at least what the commentary suggests, is if you are always in the position or, or predominantly in position of being a data processor um, and people are asking you to, you know, uh, to, to process the data, obviously, they're going to be looking at uh, your guidance here and they're going to be looking at you to, uh, you know, answer questions, right, with respect to what is your position on SHRMS 2, these national surveillance laws and those types of things. So I think taking an, uh, an approach where you are answering these questions on an upfront basis, doing the legal analysis about how these national surveillance laws impact you if they do at all, um, and answering those questions and, and figuring out supplementary measures that could be in place um, on the front end that you're going to put yourself in position either to respond to an email request asking you about this or respond to a questionnaire, right, asking you to fill out the questionnaire. On the flip side, if you're a data controller and you were looking to, you know, obviously export this data to uh, other entities, um, I think you're in a position of asking the questions, right? And so by asking the questions, you're being looking at doing things like questionnaires. And then, you know, finally, the supplementary measure analysis. I mean, that was specifically referenced in EDP guidance. So you're going to be looking at that and figuring out what measures you need to put in place to ensure that this adequacy. And so I think answering those questions, again, and looking at that and vetting all that is an important part of this process right now. So with that, that concludes our webinar of today. I'd like to thank you for attending. I always call this the shameless uh, plug portion of the webinar which is we've got a blog and we like to write on this blog and we like to put out a lot of content. Uh, so I hope that you may subscribe to our blog. It's bitebacklaw.com. We've also done a number of prior web we've also done a number of prior webinars. Um, and so you know please take a look if you've got an interest in, in sort of seeing the evolution of the CCPA and other privacy law aspects over the last year and change. Uh, you know we've got a lot of webinars. With that, I'd like to thank you for attending today's program. Uh, it's always a pleasure having you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks.